obviously you guys know who I am, Deputy Class of the Sheriff's Office, your school liaison here and a couple other schools. And uh, today we're here to kind of talk about something serious, um, talking about a mock crash. Every year in the United States we lose almost 6,000 teenage drivers to fatal crashes. Um, some alcohol, some distracted because they're on their phones. Um, but we also lose citizens because of some careless decisions that we do behind a wheel. And I mean, I was a teenager at one time. I get it. You know, it's cool. You're 16. You got your driver's license now. 16 and nine months and you get your driver's license and it's and you can't wait. Um, but one thing we really need you guys to understand, it's a big responsibility. Um, you first off, you want to be safe and you want to make sure that the other motor in public around you is safe. And a lot of the decisions you make can change a, a lot of people's fate with a lot of things. I mean, right now I want you guys to think, I want you to think about three people, three people that are most important to you. You know, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever. And then think if something happened and their life was taken in the blink of an eye. And I can tell you as a police officer, I've been doing this 11 years, um, probably the worst part of my job is when we got to do what we call a notification, where we have to go to somebody's house and tell them that a loved one died in a motor vehicle accident. Um, and I'll just say it, it sucks. I've done five of them in my, in my career. Um, and the crazy thing is I do it for other places. So if we have a citizen that lives here in Calvert and they got killed in Anne Arundel County, Anne Arundel County calls us. And then if you're that unlucky patrol guy that works in that area where that family lives, you're the one having to go tell them and you weren't even there, you don't know. Um, so. I want you guys to take this in. This is a learning tool for us. We would much rather come out here and do this than have to do what you're gonna see in real life. Cause I'm gonna tell you guys, what we're gonna do here is just another day on the job for me, all these guys in uniform, um, people in the squad and ambulance. That's what we do day in and day out. Um, so and it, for me, it's hard for me because sometimes it's you guys that I've come to know over the last three or four years. And I got these guys calling me saying, hey, you know, one of your kids was involved in this. And anybody tell me who it is, you know, it's it's one of the biggest fears that I have on the weekends, every Friday and Saturday. I'm like, well, my phone rings and it's one of these road guys at 11, 12 o'clock at night. I'm like, please tell me that maybe they just made a bat and they made a small mistake and it's nothing big. Please tell me it's nothing that I need to call Mr. Weber and we need to start making notifications. So. Um, I do have Sheriff Evans here. Um, he would like to speak to you guys. Uh, and then after that, we'll kind of go through everything else. So thank you guys very much and Sheriff Evans. Hey, good morning. Deputy class talked on something very seriously and I, I wanted to give you a little brief history of Calvert County. Got 40 years of law enforcement experience here as a trooper, a deputy and a sheriff. Um, I've been shot at, been in accidents, been in fights. The toughest part of my job, toughest part of any police officer's job as far as I'm concerned, is making notifications that someone's lost their life to their parents, to their children, etc. And the toughest one is when it's someone like you. Uh, in the early 2000s, we had way too many young driver crashes and young driver crash fatalities. The Calvary County Traffic Safety Council since then has been doing things like this mock crash. And those numbers are way down. We want them at zero. We want all deaths at zero. But let me tell you folks, I, I've done probably 50 to 75 death notifications and they're the hardest thing to do in law enforcement as far as I'm concerned so hope you pay attention today take this very serious I don't want to make anyone notifications I hope we never have to and uh, you're doing your part and your older brothers and sisters have been doing their part recently in Calvary County let's keep doing that take this serious learn something make good choices and uh, again take this seriously today thank you all right thank you sheriff appreciate it all right, guys, uh, the next speaker you're going to have is kind of going to be your main speaker for the entire event. Um, his name is uh, Bill Rector. He's a deputy with us. He's actually, uh, I trained him when he came out of the academy, right? Criminal justice got to hear some stories about him. So, hey, hey Bill, raise your hand. Wave to everybody. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but Bill's background, um, he's been with the sheriff's office, what, five years? Five years now? Man, that's crazy. All right, so five years. Um, he's also, he used to be uh, chief of Dunkirk Fire Department uh, has a big background on that and I'll tell you as as a police officer having him ride with me and we got into some stuff 
um, especially motor vehicle accidents and all that. It was really cool to kind of watch him go from, from cop to fire department side. Um, so he's going to kind of be your narrator on this entire thing. He's going to talk to you guys through the process. And without further ado, Deputy Bill Rector. All right, so let's set the, uh, set the stage real quick. Uh, we're going to have an audio here played in a minute. But uh, this vehicle is traveling northbound on Route 4. This, uh, this sedan right here. This vehicle here is uh, coming out of Huntington High School. All right, the audio is going to describe the scenario. And then once uh, the fire department and police department gets dispatched, then we'll talk about and everything that's safe place there. April 8, 2018, 3. Twenty five twenty eight PM. Nine one one Calvert County with the exact location of the emergency. Um, I'm going up Route Four and I'm on um, the northbound side. There's a car that just went by me and was going way too fast. But more importantly, the kids that are in it, they're hanging out the windows and they're screaming and they're all over the road. So okay. I think somebody needs Where are Route Four are you, man? Um, I just passed Plum Point Road. So I am, and they're, they're they're in front of me. I can like see the the tail lights of the car in front of me. What kind of vehicle is it? It's a brown Pontiac. Okay, and you have a tag number? Um, I didn't get it when when it went by me, and I can see them still up in front of me. But they're like now they're weaving all over the road. Okay, you said kids are hanging out the window. Oh my God! Oh oh God! Um, they just they're stuck flying all over the road. They must have hit something. Okay, are they still moving, or the vehicle stopped? Um, hold on, I'm coming up on it now. Um, so we're like right in front of Huntington High School, okay. and everything stopped. Um, there's there's somebody out of the car on the road, and there's somebody else. Oh my God! Oh, mm -hmm. so they have uh, they they have right? Uh, yeah. Okay. And how many vehicles are involved? Is it just them, or is another vehicle involved? It's an, a, it's, they hit a um a blue minivan. Okay, a blue minivan. Yep. Okay, we do have uh, both police and fire department on the way. Did you stay on the scene? Yeah, they need help. There's bodies all over the place. I'm getting out. Okay, what's your name, ma'am? It's uh, Linda. Okay, Linda, and you have a callback number? I do. 443-532-1188. Uh -huh. Okay. And you're going to stay on the scene until police get there? I will. You all get, a, get here quick. Okay, they're on the way, okay? All right, bye. On the way. No, 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 no. This Austin, Dad! So this time the 911 center has received the call and they're dispatching the police department and they're uh, getting additional information to dispatch the fire department as well. So typically the nature of the beast, there's uh, police officers on the street, they're usually going to arrive first. They're going to assess the scene and then figure out what exactly they have. Lydia, say something, goddammit! Say something! Help! Help! Somebody help! Oh, no! No, 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 no goddammit, no! Austin, wake up! Help! Austin, help! wake up! All right, so right now we have two uh, deputies and two state troopers arriving on the scene. And one state trooper has his medical bag and he can start uh, assessing the patients. He's not weak either, help us! No, get hurt first, he's not moving! No, get hurt first! The state troopers on the right vehicle came upon a, uh, a juvenile male who was ejected through the front windshield. They're trying to figure out what exactly they have, and uh, I'll tell you, he's not looking too good. I'm not, I'm not hurt, God damn it! Hurt help them! I'm not hurt. No, you need to get them. Nothing hurts. All right, so the fire department from Huntington is here. 
This vehicle is the rescue squad. They have primary function is to cut the cars, and they're going to get out and uh, start. Do they have? And then they're going to start uh, cutting the vehicle with their extrication tools. So if you see here, the state troopers are doing CPR on the uh, person that was ejected from the right vehicle. One person's been removed from the van and is sitting on the curb over here. You guys see? And, you know, granted, some of you might find this comical, but this is a very lifelike experience. This happens out of accidents. People get emotionally charged. They don't know what's going on. They're emotional. And then you get a bunch of people show up and you don't know who they are. Alright, so a father just showed up. Is anyone on the way over there? Found out there's an accident involving his children. Again, it's happened all day, every day. Stop. 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 And they have pronounced the one person dead at this point. He's under the white sheet. So depending on the amount of damage done to the vehicle, it might take a little bit more time than others to cut the people out of the car. So they've got the spreaders, often referred to as the jaws of life, and they have these big hydraulic cutters which can cut through just about anything. The goal right now is they're going to cut off the driver's door where there's someone trapped, and I believe they already have the back door off, or they're working on the back door now. So these fellows on the uh, rescue squad, they have brand new equipment, and even with that and, and some of the best training, it still takes some time. So it's not like they just show up and get to get the people out of the vehicle right away. It takes a little bit of time. So if you look inside the van, you see that there's someone in the driver's seat. Everybody see that? All right, they covered him up with a sheet, not necessarily because he's dead, but because uh, they don't want to get glass and all that kind of stuff all over them. So they need to gain access to that person, and then they're going to work on getting to the car. If you see here on your left, the ambulance crew has loaded up one patient. Looks like there's at least three other patients that they need to evaluate. You've got the one individual deceased in the road here.
Derner. Raise your right hand. Raise your hand. All right, so down there, my Deputy Derner, the uh, driver of the Cuban, um, as we move to the vehicle, the uh, stabilizer scene, a little bit rowdy, and uh, then we'll talk about what's going to happen next to that. All right, so the fire department has the driver's prop, which you see, on the uh, on the back siding door, minivan. And once they get that open, that's going to give them access to the uh, people inside the car. So when people get trapped in their cars, sometimes they, uh, the vehicle comes down on them, which we refer to as being pinned in the car. And if they're trapped in the car, it's just that the doors cannot open. So in this situation, they're just trapped. But uh, sometimes the dashboard will come down on their legs and we need to push the dash and get it off their, uh, their legs, which oftentimes breaks their legs as well. All right, so Deputy Derner in the middle here. He's uh, assigned a patrol division. There's suspicion that this driver's been drinking alcohol, and he's gonna place them through uh, some testing, which is called standard field sobriety testing. First thing he's gonna do is check their eyes. Make sure they're not wearing glasses or anything like that. And then he's gonna put them through the test. The test sort of speaks for itself, so I'm not gonna narrate through that, but you guys can figure out what's going on. All right, so now that Deputy Derner has checked his eyes, there's two more tests he's going to put him through. This is the one that you guys see on TV all the time, the walk and turn. All right, so when we do the uh, walk and turn, we're not just looking to make sure that they, they can walk in a straight line. There's a bunch of different clues, clues that we're looking for, and Deputy Derner is taking note of that. Typically, he's probably going to have his, uh, his chest camera on, his body worn camera, and be reporting over there. And that's uh, going to assist in his charges if it gets to that point. And Bill, I think this is the... So the father of the deceased showed up. So another thing you guys need to understand, when we have accidents like this, especially with social media and being a small county, a lot of times family members find out and then they show up on the scene. And I mean, that's a dad. Obviously, we don't want to do what we have to do, but this is a crime scene. And we have to make sure that this crime scene stays secure because investigators are going to get involved. We got to figure out the termination. It's not just like there's a crash and that's over with. I mean, there's there's going to be charges on this driver here. Um, and to make sure that we properly do it, it's a crime scene. We need to treat it that way. So we can't have anybody just, just coming in. So uh, it's, it's hard sometimes for us as parents. Um, I can only imagine what he's going through. But to see your kid, I mean, I I've had them where they've come up and punched me in the chest and, and done all that, so it's just another side of it. All right, so if you see the uh, the fire department has gotten the driver's door off the van, the rear door off the van, 
and uh, their their process is essentially done. If you look inside the blue minivan, there's a white sheet over an individual. Uh, apparently, during the execution process, the uh, paramedics determined that that person was not viable and pronounced them dead. So, lots of things happen once this occurs. If we've got now we have two dead people here, we're going to contact the, uh, the crash reconstruction team, and they're going to respond whether they're at home on their day off or if they're at work. And this now becomes a crime scene. So the driver um, did not adequately complete the standard field sobriety test. So he's been placed in handcuffs and placed under arrest. So they'll take him down to the sheriff's office. He'll be given an opportunity to take a breathalyzer test if he so chooses. But uh, either way, he can take So the scene is sort of stabilized at this point. There's not a whole lot of active components to it. The fire department is done doing their, their part. Um, now we need to wait for the funeral home to show up, the tow trucks to show up, the crash reconstruction team to show up, and uh, then we need to start making contact to those that were affected by the accident. So in a matter like this, the, the situation evolves from a fire department scene to now a crime scene. And we work hand in hand with the uh, medical examiner's office, our crash reconstruction team and the funeral homes to sort of get this situation. Uh, we try to figure out what exactly happened, how the accident occurred, what factors went into this accident occurred, and then uh, we'll charge appropriately from there. So the medical examiner's office would respond to a matter like this. They would uh, process the individuals that are deceased, name, identification, you know, all that information. And then they would make contact or our detectives would make contact with the funeral home, which is pulling up. And obviously this is a compressed timeline, but on any fatal accident, this is, this is the process that we go through. Sometimes we have accidents to the point where we can't get, or it's not feasible for us to get the people inside the vehicle out of the vehicle. They're too mangled up in the car. The car is impaled in them, they're impaled in the car, whatever the case is. So that's when the fire department will come back and a much, oftentimes more time consuming process, take the car apart by many different means. They sometimes have to use saws, they sometimes have to use air tools to take this car apart in order to get the person out of the vehicle and into a body bag. So right now we've sent three people to the hospital Two people are going to body bags, and one person is going to jail. So we had a car full of uh, high school aged kids in this scenario, right? And one of the biggest challenges that we face sometimes is making contact with the family. One, it's challenging because we need to tell the family, but two, we sometimes have issues finding the family. So social media is one thing that we battle with a lot because people post pictures and video, these different things of the vehicles and parents find out, and then they're calling the sheriff's officer or the barrack and asking questions that we can't release over the phone.
So then we need to try to contact them at work. Um, we make every effort to notify people that they've lost a loved one in person because it's the right thing to do. But uh, sometimes that means contacting, you know, the uh, Florida State Police and having them respond in person to notify someone that lives in Florida. All right, so let's talk about the funeral homes. So the funeral home is going to sh they're going to show up with uh, however many people they can, depending on how many people they need to take. And these bodies are going to be going to Baltimore for an autopsy. Anything that is uh, not in a controlled environment, like a nursing home or a hospital, typically they're going to be going to Baltimore for an autopsy. So because it's uh, what time is it? let's say it's eight o'clock, it's likely that they're going to get an autopsy done this morning. But if it's a busy night for up in Baltimore, that's where everybody in Maryland that dies the day before goes for an autopsy. If it's a busy day, they're going to go into the refrigerator and wait till tomorrow. All right, so one thing we'll talk about briefly is the uh, crash reconstruction side. So there's um, officers for the sheriff's office and the state police that are trained to measure distances, look at the roadway, look at the damage to the vehicles, and determine how this accident occurred. That, uh, that training is pretty intense. There's a lot of math involved. Um, but in this scenario, you know, we had a 911 call that sort of laid out what exactly happened. That person is going to be a very good witness to the detectives that are able to interview. And from there, they'll sort of get a big picture as to what took place. So once the, uh, actually concurrently with the deceased being here, the crash reconstruction team will show up, they'll start taking photos, they'll spray paint the roadway, they'll find any damage to the roadway, gouges, damage to the curb, whatever they may have struck. And then they'll start measuring the vehicles. If any of the vehicles are uh, relatively new, we will seize those vehicles they will be taken to our uh, impound lot where we'll download the vehicle. We'll be able to get speed, seat belts, um, lots of different cell phone use, lots of different things we can gain from doing a search warrant on the vehicle. That's done over the, uh, the next couple of days after the accident. can't reiterate enough that this is uh, this is about as realistic as it can get. It's realistic for the police officers, it's realistic for the fire department personnel, and it should be realistic for you guys. So like I said, so they're going to load these uh, the two dead people up into the, the van here, and uh, they'll make contact with uh, Baltimore, and then Baltimore will accept them as uh, autopsies, and then they'll be transported up there. All right, so the gentlemen from the uh, funeral home are about done. 
Before we go into a uh, question and answer period, we're going to thank a couple folks that were uh, pretty instrumental in this today. Impact Research, the Huntingtown Volunteer Fire Department, the Calvert Advanced Life Support, which is the uh, emergency vehicle in the back. They're based out of Prince Frederick, and they're the uh, paramedics for the county. A-plus towing and repair in St. Leonard. They're the ones that uh, took care of the vehicles for staging this today. The Calvert County Public Schools, the D.A.R.E. officers, the Huntington High School, and the, uh, the drama students. They did an excellent job. So thank them. The, uh, the folks from the funeral home, they're from Roush Funeral Home, and they're doing this uh, because they believe in this program. And then lastly, the, uh, the folks that took the 911 call, that was obviously done prior to today. Um, that's the Calvert County 911 Center. And uh, I'll turn this over to you, Mr. Class. All right. Thank you, sir. You know what? You did a really good job. All right. Um, can we give Bill Rector a big round of applause? <laughs> guys, Eddie, as he said, it doesn't get any more real than this. And just kind of watching you guys, I saw, you know, I saw staff members tearing up. I saw some of you guys tear up. And I'll tell you, man, we do too. It, uh, it's not fun. Um, you know, it was funny watching the uh, Hearst pick somebody up. I remember one time we had a fatal, and we were right on the side of Route 4, and it was during the day. And we couldn't get, we couldn't get the Hearst any closer to us. And literally, it was me, a couple guys, some guys from the fire department, and somebody was holding a sheet, and I'm carrying somebody's loved one. You know, just, like at the time, you're fine, but afterwards, let me tell you something, buddy. You get back in that patrol car, or you go behind one of these big squad trucks, and you'll shed some tears, you know. Um, and that's why we say this is so important. This stuff happens every day in this country. Um, and it's, it's one of the hardest things we ever have to deal with. Um, just as human beings, as, as losing somebody, even people that you don't know. Um, so, I really do hope you guys got something out of this. You know, prom is right around the corner. Uh, it's May 19th for us. Please be thinking about that stuff. I'm not dumb. I know, no matter how much I sit up here and tell y'all, don't drink, don't do this. I'm not dumb. I know what happens. Okay? Um, but we don't need that. You know, Calvert High had a loss um, last year, and as a senior class, I mean, we've already had a loss. I don't want to go through that again. So, um, I'm always here for you guys, anything I can ever do, but uh, let's just make sure that we think about the consequences of our choices, because you guys just saw every consequence that could possibly happen um, when you make a, a poor decision like this. And, you know, it doesn't just have to be about alcohol, man. That text them. And I watch you guys. You know, if I got to go out here and run a traffic light, I see some of you guys turn into the school and you're sitting at the light and you're on your phone. You know, I know you're doing it while you're driving. That text can wait. You know, some of these guys I work with and my wife, they, they hate me because I don't get on the phone. I just, I don't. I don't want to get on the phone, man, because after you handle stuff like this and you see people lose somebody that they care about, that text can wait. You know, and uh, so just... Just try to think about it. Just keep that in mind. Now, um, we do have a little bit of time, and we've actually never really done this, but Bill and I were kind of talking, and we wanted to do maybe like a Q&A session, question and answer question with you guys. So if anybody has a question, um, you'll be directing a question towards Bill, but just come down here to the front. You can use my mic, ask a question, but we want to open it up to you guys because this is a teaching tool, and we got a little bit of time, and if you guys know if I get in a classroom, I get in a classroom as much as I can because it's all about education. That's why we're here. So if there's anybody that's got something, come on down. If not, then we might be a little early going to auditorium. I don't know what to tell you. Ron, you got one? Yeah. How long does it normally take for the cleanup scene to happen? Step out here. Step out here. I didn't, I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. That's all right. How long, how long does the cleanup normally take? Like, how many hours usually? Well, it all depends. So, um, if you guys can think back, we had a fatal accident at uh, Route 2 and C. Jones Road a couple weeks back. You guys remember that? All right. We lost uh, some folks in that accident. 
the cleanup itself doesn't necessarily take a whole lot of time, but you got to think the fire department has to do their job, and then it becomes a crime scene. So the, then the investigators have to do their job. So we had to call out the North Beach Fire Department to get elevated pictures from their ladder truck, and then the tow truck has to come, the medical examiner has to come. So I, I would say there's no standard time frame because it depends on how big the incident is. Um, but that incident probably took about two and a half, three hours. Well, we try to get, uh, any, any time that someone dies in a car crash, one of the priorities is to try to get the, the scene stabilized and get those bodies out, okay? But we're at the whim of the medical examiner's medical response. And, yeah. We're at the whim of the medical examiner's response, which could, they could be coming from Baltimore and yeah, the funeral home. Good question. Good question. I'll try that one back on. Who's got some more questions? Yep. Was this like an actual incident just reenacted? So this is a staged incident because uh, of where we are, right? You guys know the roads that we were simulating. Um, so yes, this was a staged incident. Who else? Yes, ma'am. With social media um, and if a lot of the kids finding out that maybe their friend's been in an accident, how do you want them to handle uh, going to the scene or how they can support their friends? So I would say there's two ways to answer that question. First and foremost, social media is a great tool when it's used appropriately and it's a terrible tool when it's not. So if, if stuff is put out there about a bad accident, then names are thrown out there. And so that's not what we want. If people find out about an accident, which is going to happen, we would rather you respond to someone else's residence. Do not respond to the scene because there's nothing you're going to be able to do there. Um, as a matter of fact, it actually makes our job a lot harder if people show up because then we have to call more police officers and make a staging area. So if you can, maybe respond to school, respond to church, respond somewhere else. Don't respond to the scene. Answer your question, ma'am. All right. I was wondering how you guys thought like other ways to reduce like these incidents happening. Sure. So the question was, have we done other things to reduce these types of incidents from happening? So yes, we do every day, and that's by uh, traffic enforcement, um, targeted enforcement for drunk driving. Um, if you see police officers on the side of the road on a traffic stop, they're not doing that because they get joy out doing that. They're doing it because there was a need. So if a car is pulled over, there, there was a reason for that, whether it's a state trooper or a county uh, deputy. So the traffic stops help. That slows people down. Um, you know, social media information put out there from the sheriff's office and state police. A bunch of different education. Who else? So, um, the guy had a head injury. Why didn't they check him for a concussion? Like, if he couldn't pass the test? So, uh, I don't want to speak for the paramedic. If he wants to come up here and talk, he's more than welcome to. But concussions are, are sort of the bottom of the priority list. So we've got, uh, want to make sure they're alive, right? That's priority number one. And then two, any bleeding, any airway issues, we sort of try to mitigate that first. Because if you're not, if you're bleeding profusely and you can't breathe, a concussion is really not a priority, right? So the doctors at the hospital, once they sort of figure out what bones are broken and what, you know, what's causing the bleeding, then they'll probably take into account, you know, what caused the concussion or if they have one. Now, if your question was towards like the, the driver that was under the influence and like, why did you rush that? Well, here's one thing. I mean, you saw the parent that showed up. So sometimes like I've had them before where we literally couldn't do field sobriety right then and there because the scene was not safe. I mean, you got to think somebody just lost a loved one and one family family member finds out another family next thing you know you got 10 15 people that are ready to kill this person right and while i understand why they feel that way at the same time we still have to risk like protect this person so sometimes we literally will throw them in our car and drive them to the sheriff's office and run them through field sobriety at the sheriff's office so it's a safe secure environment or we'll go somewhere else that's away from the scene um and it's just every situation is different um you know, it's, uh, but it's, that was a good question. So thank you. Sorry, I think you missed your question. 
I answered her question completely wrong. The person that was like under the influence, would they be charged with manslaughter? So it all depends. Um, I don't, uh, Mr. Mr. Rappaport, you mind coming out here for this? All right, so this gentleman here, he's our, uh, one of our state's attorneys. Um, and his, one of his primary responsibilities is he works with the Crash Street Construction Team. And he is the prosecutor at the state level for any uh, fatal crash reconstruction. So the question was, would the driver who was uh, drunk going to be charged with manslaughter? So yes is the short answer. Uh, based on this fact, he's actually, there's two fatals. So he would be charged with manslaughter twice. And depending on the injuries of the other parties, he could be charged with life-threatening injuries as well. Can you just go through the uh, different types of charges that are available, sort of top to bottom? Sure. So the top charge is uh, manslaughter by motor vehicle. That carries 10 years as a maximum penalty for each fatality. There's also a negligent manslaughter. That's a lower charge, so it's automatically charged as a matter of course. The, there's a life-threatening injury if you're impaired by alcohol. And lastly, depending on the facts of the case, there could be a second degree assault for the surviving victims as well. Along with the, question? I'm sorry, there's also the alcohol related driving offenses. So you have DUI, DWI, uh, and then some payable traffic potentially. Who else? Good questions so far. Yes, sir. Thank you. So if you end up getting charged with manslaughter, why is that a different sentence than just getting pulled over driving drunk? Because they're still risking somebody's life. So why is manslaughter a different charge rather than DUI? Is that what you're saying? Right. So, okay, that's more of a, a rhetorical question. But so the question, I guess, Mr. Rappaport is, DWI is so severe, why is that penalty so much less than manslaughter? Good luck answering that. Well, in order to have manslaughter, you have to have a fatality. So the, just the fact of driving impaired does not, that gets you to the DUI, but then you need that with uh, gross negligence and a fatality to get to the manslaughter charge. Correct. And so the penalties, the legislature sets penalties from out of Annapolis that we deal with the state laws and then that's what we prosecute based on. So I get it. DUI is pretty serious is what you're trying to say, right? And it's a, it's a dumb thing to do, but unfortunately we can only charge what the legislators allow us to charge, right? So what if the person driving this vehicle was not under the influence of alcohol? What would the charges be? So it all depends. Um, I'll let him answer this, but let's say that there was cell phone use involved. Let's say that there was some type of distracted driving. Um, that all plays a part. So alcohol is, is one factor of many different factors that we look at, but uh, distracted driving is just as bad. And, and you can talk about the, uh, the charges. So you do not need alcohol to charge vehicular manslaughter. It's a factor to consider, but also distracted driving, speed, uh, if you're impaired, drugs, drug, right, correct. If you're impaired by drugs, so there's a bunch of different factors, and it doesn't. There's no certain amount. So if I'm driving 100 miles an hour on Route Four, that would obviously raise the level uh, to potentially to manslaughter. But if I'm driving 60 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone, that may also do the same thing. Distracted driving, being on your cell phone. Uh, there's a, there's multiple factors that come into it. Who else? Uh, how would you determine who's at fault for the crime if they're not under the influence or anything like that? So the question is, how would we determine who is at fault if they're not under the influence? So there's lots of things that go into consideration with that. Um, the crash reconstruction team, because it is a fatal, um, is responding regardless. And they're going to um, measure speed. They're going to download the cars. They're going to determine who is going which direction based off of witness statements. Um, it's typically not a decision that's made overnight. It's going to require some cell phones to be downloaded via search warrants. It's going to require the vehicles to be downloaded via search warrants. 
Um, we're going to get witness statements from anybody that may have seen it. And then we're also going to try to get any cameras from the roadway that uh, may have caught it. So we sort of take into consideration everything that we can find, and then we present it to Mr. Rappaport for a final review. Uh, another question that I had that a student asked was, um, you know, when a parent comes running onto the scene, say they punch a police officer, which has happened to me before, do you charge that person? No. I mean, you guys got to take into consideration, you know, why they did what they did. And, and like I said, when the one hit me, I'm not going to charge them. I mean, it, they just lost their loved ones. So it was a good question. Um, but no, we're, we're not looking to charge anybody when they get upset and do something like that. All right, so one thing we want to touch on that uh, I think I touched on briefly, but we want to touch on a little bit more, just give me one second, okay, is uh, the information that we can gather from, from downloading a car. The uh, computer data recorder inside the vehicle records just about anything and everything, and then what that doesn't capture, the content in your dashboard, you know, smart computer, if you've got like a fancy Tahoe or something like that, that captures everything else. So anytime you... Uh, you Bluetooth your your phone to a car, which is a great thing to do, so you're hands-free. Um, that content is typically getting transferred to the vehicle. So GPS locations, where you went, where you know where you were, where, where you were headed, if you were using GPS, um, if you were talking on your phone, if you weren't, if you were texting, if you weren't. But more importantly, the vehicle is going to be able to tell us a lot of things. It doesn't tell us necessarily speed, but there's calculations that we can do from the information gathered to determine the amount of braking that you did prior to the incident, which will corroborate the skid marks if there are any. Um, it will be able to tell us speed if we can do the calculations properly. We can pretty much dissect the incident just by downloading the car, and then we have a pretty good idea where we can then put that into a computer system and it maps it for us. And then one other tool that we use um, in fatals is, you know the surveyors on the side of the road you guys see? You guys know what I'm talking about? We have that type of system where we can pinpoint and measure to the exact amount where these cars are in relation to the roadway. If one vehicle is across the double yellow line, it's likely that that vehicle might have caused the accident. Um, so it's not. Th this is not where the investigation ends. The investigation is just starting at this point. We try to, you know, get everybody out of here as quick as we can, and then uh, then the real investigation starts. So hopefully that. Uh, touched on the point that I was told to. So this is kind of similar to the concussion question, but wouldn't you want to check for that or for shock before doing the field sobriety tests? Why wouldn't you just do a breathalyzer? So as, as part of his um, initial questioning during the standard field sobriety test, that type of questioning takes place. Are you under the influence of anything? If they answer yes, then, then there's different courses that we take. Um, are you impaired by any, you know, are you taking medications? Do you wear glasses? Do you wear contacts? You know, are your eyes jacked up? Do you not, you know, do you not have one eye or whatever the case is? Um, and that's all painting the picture to the officer that's doing that investigation. So then from there, we are not, you know, as a law enforcement officer, we're not trained to determine what a concussion is, okay? Um, so that that's sort of a secondary part of it. But uh, we certainly take, like the first part is the health questions. So we try to find out what medication they might be on, which could restrict their pupils or dilate their pupils. So and Mr. Sometimes. Muschietto, do you want to touch on that point? I think you'd be a good point. <laughs> Number one, our first priority is to make sure anybody that's been involved in a motor vehicle crash, their safety is number one. If we can, we'll have to get them to the hospital. But one of the, this is a good question. One of the things that are actually built in the curriculum of the standardized field sobriety test is a medical assessment. We check pupil size to make sure they're equal. If you have an equal pupil sizes, that's a good indication. Someone might have a head injury. And we also check for equal tracking, make sure the eyes can track equally. Anybody's got a head injury, neurological issue, will start to show symptoms and signs of a head injury at that point. And if we have those signs, we stop immediately. Again, because the safety and the health of everyone on the scene is our priority. And in that case, people tend to think that we need field sobriety tests to make an arrest. We don't. All we need is reasonable grounds. The odor of alcoholic beverage, the presence of alcohol on the scene, statements of witnesses you're driving beforehand, decision making, all that we can articulate that someone may be impaired and unable to operate a vehicle safely. That's all we need to get a blood test. And of course now we can do these two or three page search warrants for your blood. So we're going to get it. 
All right. Did I answer your question? All right. Thank you, Corporal Mosqueda. All right, guys. Um, we're going to get ready to go inside, but before we do, if we could just get a round of applause for everybody that was out here and helped out with this.